بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى ما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وانتم الاعلون ان كنتم مؤمنين صدق الله العظيم Until it's due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created us, sustained us, and above all created us in the best of ummah, that is the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On one occasion, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was traveling, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam happened to stop by at the residence of a Bedouin. And this Bedouin was exceptional in his hospitality, and he really looked after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So as Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left him, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him that if you ever come to Medina to Munawwara, please come and visit me. I would like to reciprocate the good. So after a while, this Bedouin came to Medina to Munawwara and he came into Masjid al Nabawi. He met Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then as he was leaving, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called in front and said, Salli, I would like to give you something, but ask whatever you want. So this Bedouin said, As'aluka da'batan arkabuha. Give me an animal a horse or a, a camel that I can ride. <coughs> so Nabi Sassim looked at Sahaba and he said, Ahti, give him. Then Nabi Sassim told him, tell me, ask me what else do you want? So this better one said, Kalban yahrisu ghanabi. I need a dog that will be able to tend to my flock of sheep. So Nabi Sassim smiled and he said, Ahti, give it to him. So the Sahaba gave it to him. On the third time, Nabi Sassim said to him, tell me, Ask again, tell me really, what do you want? So he said, Give me a slave or a, a domestic worker who can assist my family in their daily work at home. So Nabi Sassim said, Ah, then he give it to him. Then Nabi Sassim told him, Can you not be like the old lady of Banu Israel? Can you not be like her? So Sahaba said, Oh Nabi of Allah, what are you referring to? Who is this old lady of Banu Israel? And then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained to Sahaba that, Yus that when Yusuf Alayhi Salam had passed away and he was buried, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala had ordered Musa Alayhi Salam that when he needed to move from the place that he was in, Allah ordered Musa Alayhi Salam that when you leave, you will take the body of Yusuf Alayhi Salam with you and bury it somewhere else. So Musa Alayhi Salam was asking around, where is Yusuf Alayhi Salam buried? And people told him, there's only one old lady of the Bani Israel who knows. So Musa Ali Salam went to her and said that this is my command, you're the only person with this information. You need to tell me where is Yusuf Ali Salam buried because I need to fulfill my mission, my task. And she said, no problem, I'll give you the information but I want something in return. So he said, what do you want? She said, As'aluka murafaqataka fil jannah. I want to be your companion in jannah. So Musa Ali Salam said, I cannot guarantee you that. And as he was walking around, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa alayhi salam, oh, Musa, you need the information she has. Give her what she wants and tell her she will be your companion in Jannah. When Musa alayhi salam turned around, he told this old lady, she then directed him and he found it. What was the Bisa salam teaching Sahaba radiallahu anhum through this? What the Bisa salam told this Bedouin is when you ask, don't ask low. When you ask of Allah, ask the highest. When you want to do something in life, don't aim low. Always aspire to be the best. And there is something that we as Muslims should always endeavor to be. We should always be the best. A hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Inna Allah yuhibbu ma'ani al-umur wa ashrafaha. Allah loves excellency in everything. Allah doesn't want us as, as, as Muslims to be second grade. Allah doesn't want of us as Muslims to be by the way. Allah wants us as Muslims to be the best in everything that we do. Inna Allah yuhibbu ma'ani umur wa ashrafaha. Allah always loves excellency in everything. Now sometimes we look at somebody who has achieved something which is our goal in life. But we're looking at the end result. We need to understand there's a beautiful Arabic saying that says, Ar-raha la tudrak raha if you want a good life, you cannot achieve it by having a good life in the beginning of your career. Ar-raha, a good, peaceful, content life, cannot be achieved by starting off your life in that way. Man arad al-na'im, tarak al-na'im. 
the one who wants the bounties, the one who wants all the good things, will have to leave the good things in the starting of his life. So if you look at a person who's achieved something, for example, in business, he's got a brilliant business model, it's successful, or in a career, somebody who's really remarkable in what they do, don't look at the end result. Go to the beginning of that person's life. You will be amazed to see this person was probably traveling by public transport. This person had to travel, undergo difficulties, earn very little, shared a room with someone, had difficulties, and then grew up to where they are. We look at the end result and we're sitting back and expecting to achieve that. No. Allah wants us to achieve the best, but we must make the effort in order to get there. Take for example the hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Today, you talk about any hadith, what do we do? We go onto the internet and you can Google it. Imam Bukhari Rahimahullah, one of the most authentic books of hadith. So you and I pick up the book of Imam Bukhari and we say this hadith is narrated in Bukhari. Do we know what Imam Bukhari Rahimahullah underwent in order to compile this book? Do you know how much of traveling he had to do? Do you know what difficulties he underwent? Do you know that every time he wrote one hadith in his book, as Sahih al-Bukhari, he would go, he would take a bath, he would apply, apply itar, he would then read two rakats of salah, then he would make a sihara to Allah and then he would write one hadith. And this is after all the effort of acquiring the hadith. Look at the four Imams of Fiqh. Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed bin Hattab rahimahullah. In their era, they weren't the only ulama. There were hundreds, thousands of ulama in their time. But their effort and their struggle and their sincerity is what brought them to a level where they are so recognized in the entire world. They would sit, for example, when Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah would pass a verdict, you would have 40 men who are masters of every science in which they had studied, all sitting around him, and then he would make a decision. So nothing comes without effort. And these men were not looking at becoming the bottom end. They were not happy with our mentality of BCOM. No. They wanted to be the best. Why? When you do something, Allah wants you to do the best. Hadith of Bukhari, Nabi Sallallahu said, إِذَا سَأَلْتُمُ اللَّهَ الْجَنَّةِ When you ask Allah for Jannah, then don't just say, Allah, I want Jannah. Nabi Sallallahu said, فَاسْأَلُهُ الْجَنَّةَ الْفِرْدَوْسِ الْأَعْلَى Don't just say, Allah, I want Jannah. Say, Allah, I want Jannah to Firdaus al-A'la. I want the highest levels of Jannah, and that is Firdaus. Why? Because Firdaus, that level of Jannah, is where the Arsh of Allah is, and all the rivers of Jannah flow from this particular river. Why would Nabi Sassan teach us this? You're asking Allah for Jannah. Is it not sufficient to just get Jannah? Whereas Jannah is something that everybody wants. No, Nabi Sassan says, when you ask Allah for Jannah, don't be mediocre. Don't ask for the bottom end. Don't say I'm just, you know, with the, go with the flow. No, we always want the best. Now, whether it's in your relationship, whether it's in your career, whether it's in your business, we must always aspire to be the best and don't be intimidated by who is around you. Abdullah ibn Abbas was walking around and he saw some of the youngsters, his friends. And he went to them and he said, Hello, manat rabu'il, min ashabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, come, let's go and sit in the company of the companions of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the sahaba radiallahu anhum, and let's learn knowledge from them. Now, who better to learn knowledge from than the sahaba radiallahu anhum? Every, every sahabi of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is unique, the best of creation after the Anbiya alayhi wa sallam. They were phenomenal humans. They were the best. And every one of them were brilliant in what they did. So Abdullah bin Abbas said, let's go and learn from them. So his friend said, in the presence of Abu Bakr and Umar and Ali and Uthman radiallahu if you telling us to go and study, why would we study? He said, Nusbih ulama. We go and study, we become ulama. They said, in the presence of all of these giants, intellectual giants, where do we fit in? So Abdullah bin Abbas looked at them and he said, if you're not in person, I'm going. And what happened? Abdullah bin Abbas became faqih wa hadhi al-ummah. He became such and such in-depth in knowledge that anybody had any questions, who will they go to? Abdullah ibn Abbas So despite who's around you, always aspire 
to be the best in whatever you do. Always strive to be the best. Why are we complacent with being the retailer? Why do we, when we, somebody sets up a business or a youngster is going into business, why are we always complacent with being the retailer? Why can't we aspire for the retailer to become the wholesaler? And why can't the wholesaler aspire to become the manufacturer? Why can't we as Muslims become the inventors? Who invented algebra? A Muslim. Who invented the first flying object? A Muslim. Who invented the first and started the first university in the world? A Muslim. Muslims are not second. There's one rule in life, and that one rule is don't be second best. Be the best. Muslims have always been in the forefront of being the best. And that is what we need to aspire. Whether it's in our relationships, I must be the best husband. I must be the best father. I must be the best brother. I must be the best Muslim in my masjid. I must be the best person in my community. I must be in my business, in my league. When people talk about my in my area, I must be the best. I must be the name that comes up. We cannot always sit back and just be complacent with whatever we are doing. And sometimes in life, if you're the smartest guy in the room, you're sitting in the wrong room. Because if we sit with people who are like-minded, like we'll stay where we are. But sit with people who are better than you, you'll up your game in life. And as Muslims, that is exactly what we need to do. In every aspect of our life, we need to up our game. When you go into a, into a hospital and you see that the name is there of all the doctors and you see a Muslim doctor on the top, what happens? We say, hey, alhamdulillah, we've got a Muslim doctor here. You go into an engineering company and you see the name of a Muslim, what do we say? Hey, alhamdulillah, I've got a Muslim here. Muslims must not be at the bottom. We must aspire to be at the top and excellent in everything that we do. When it comes to technology, we must send our children to become the best. When it comes to every aspect of our life, we must make sure we are the best. When it comes to even in the medical field, let us not suffice on just having Muslim GPs. Let's go a step forward. Let's encourage our young children. Let's encourage our youth. Specialize. Go into all the different fields. And how does it benefit us? You know, sometimes we feel that in order to be close to Allah, you have to be an alim, you have to be a mufti, you have to be a qari. Without doubt, the science of Islam is the best knowledge. No doubt. But who said a doctor can't bring you closer to Allah? Recently, a lady passed away with cancer. Young. Allah granted the highest abode of Jannah. When we attended her janazah, before the body even left the house, I met the husband and he said something remarkable to me. Now, can, can you understand, at a time like this, it's a time when the man will only talk about what is very close to his heart. It's a very, very delicate time. He says, you know, we went to a doctor, an ENT, who did the operation on his wife. And he said, this doctor was amazing. He explained to us how Allah has created this portion of the human body. It's like a, like a computer. He said, it links every part of your body. And he said, the way he explained to us how Allah has created this portion of your neck and how it links everything from your brain going down to your organs. And he explained that you don't only have one jugular, you've got a few jugular veins. And then he mentioned the ayat of the Quran, Allah says, we are even closer to you than your jugular vein. He says, you know, after this doctor finished with everything, we felt despite everything, the cancer, whatever, we realize the greatness of Allah in our bodies. And this woman came closer to Allah because of learning what is the mechanism that Allah created in our body. Now if that wasn't a Muslim doctor, there's a, a female gynecologist. Whenever the ladies go to her, she will tell them, go and make wudu before she takes them in. Go and make wudu and read two rakats of salah. Because obviously after that you won't be able to read salah for a good few weeks. So read your salah. Then if there's still time, she'll tell them to read Surah Yasin. When she starts the procedure, you will hear her reading Bismillah rahman rahim When the baby is born, I am telling you not of hearsay, 
I'm personally experiencing. When the baby is born, you should say, Alhamdulillah, MashaAllah, Allah has blessed you with this. If those were not our Muslim doctors, where would we be? So we cannot sit back and look at only being at the bottom. No. During the time of COVID, how many of our doctors were in the hospitals going from bed to bed, reading Shahada for people? When nobody else was around in, who was reading Shahada for all those people? Our Muslim doctors. That is the legacy we are proud about. That is a legacy we want to see. When we're sending our children to varsity, give them the equipment to be good Muslims. Make sure they become a Muslim whatever they are becoming. But our Muslims must be in the forefront of everything that they do. And if in aspiring to be the best in your league, you don't end up being the best, remember, it's not always just about being the best, it's about your best effort. Sometimes Allah hasn't meant something for you. Don't lose hope. Remember, a winner is normally a failure who tried again. So if you could not come right in your studies the first time, try again. If a business didn't work the first time, don't sit back and say, no, I'm not a businessman. Try something else. We are Muslims, we try, we put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't give up. What is part of Iman? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we don't become despondent on that which we don't achieve, but when you reach an accomplishment, we don't become proud and arrogant, see what I achieved, we attribute it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in every aspect of our life as Muslims, if your children, you're sending your son to become an Ali, make sure he becomes the best Ali. You send your son to become a Qari, make sure he becomes the best. He must not just go and become like the, you know, like we're going with the flow. It's only dead fish that go with the flow. We must become the best. And as Muslims, aspire to be high. But remember in life, to be the best, you don't have to blow out somebody else's candle. Sometimes for us to look bright, we want to blow out somebody else's candle. There's no need for that in life. And people will criticize you when you're trying to become the best. So whether it's in your business, whether it's in your relationship, whether, whatever it is, you will get those who will try and bring you down. You start a business, somebody will tell you, do you think this is the right time to start a business? Or somebody will come to you and say, you know, I know somebody who started this business and it was a failure. So people will try and blow your candle out. But as a Muslim, what do you do? Somebody comes to you and say, I will make sure you don't succeed. What do you do? You try even harder. You try even harder. And you make sure you put your trust in Allah and you become the best. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi was giving da'wah in Makkah al Mukarramah, the kuffar used to stand on the outskirts of Makkah. And as the people would come into Makkah, the kuffar would tell them, there's a man inside by the name of Muhammad, don't listen to him. Every person entering, what would they tell him? Don't listen to him. What would people do? They would come into Makkah, automatically the curiosity is already there. So they want to know now, who is this man Muhammad everybody is talking about? When they would see him, now they would say, but this is not the man they are speaking about. Let's hear what he's got to say. Isn't that how so many people entered Islam? So if somebody is trying to bring you down, they are only doing it because they below you. So don't lose hope. Don't give up. Muslims never ever give up. We go further. Don't lose hope. Always remember that there is a second chance for everybody in life. And very crucial in our society is when you see somebody who is trying hard at something, don't bring them down. If you see somebody who has failed, be the person who will go and lift them up. Be the one who will go and encourage them. Be the one who will support them. That is what the Ummah needs. The Ummah needs those who will give words of encouragement. You know, to make an effort to get people into Jannah is very hard. To make a concerted effort that I want to get everybody into Jannah is very hard. That's why so few people do it. And to put anybody in Jahannam is easy. But we should be amongst those who will say, I'm going to make an effort to get everybody into Jannah. And anybody who we see, give them that second chance in life. Be that encouragement. 
be that hope, be the one that will give people hope in life, that put your trust in Allah and become the best. The sideline critics, you know, they'll watch the game and criticize from outside. Have you ever thought why they're on the sideline? Because they're not man enough to come in the game. And why aren't they man enough to come in the game? Because if they come in the game, they're so afraid that they may not confront a the player, they're probably going to confront the coach. And they can't handle that. So those who want to criticize you, leave them aside. They're there for a reason. You prove to the world, prove to your Allah, that Allah, you gave me the ability, I'll become the best businessman that I can. I will become the best at my profession. I will make the Muslim Ummah proud. I will make this Ummah stand up with its, proud, with its pride and show the, Muslim, the whole world that we Muslims, we're not second best. We serve the world. We show people who is Allah. We show people what is right. We don't give up on people. Sheikh Ali here, Hafidhullah, one of the leading scholars of Saudi, he was on his way for a youth program. And on the way, one of his companions said to him, you know, there's a lady who called me from Taif and she wanted to see us urgently. It's about her son. So he said, okay, let's go. So they went to Taif and they met the mother. And the mother says, listen, my son is a good boy, but he's gone off the track. He's doing all the wrong. Everybody has given up on my son. But I see you are going out for a youth program. I have a request as a mother. Please call my son. Please make an effort on him. Please don't turn your back on him like everybody else has given up hope. So these two, these two alama, they go, they phone the youngster, they meet him wherever he is. And Sheikh Hanifi has got a very beautiful way. Uh, you know what? He was talking to a youngster who was apparently off the track. And he looked at the youngster and he said, you know, you remind me of myself when I was young. So the youngster looked at him and says, you sure? Me? He said, yes. And one of my teachers saw potentially me and look where I am today. That youngster turned his whole life around because of one motivational statement. So he spoke to this youngster and he said, look, we've got a program on tonight. Please come and join us. So the youngster thought these people came all the way just to meet me. He came to the program. At the end of that program, he says, I saw this youngster walking from the back of the crowd. He came onto the stage. He hugged him. He cried and he said, by Allah, I made Toba today. He made such down that stage and he went home. Sheikh Alif here, Allah says, it was just a few months later when the same mother called us and she said, you need to come to my home. So they thought, okay, maybe the youngster once again went off, they went to the house. When they got to the house, the mother says, the first time I called you here was because of my son. Today I have called you here to make dua for him. My son has passed away. So they said, your son was so young, what happened? So she says, from the day my son came back from your program, nobody was before him in the masjid. He was first in the masjid for every salah. And nobody would leave the masjid. He would always be the last person to leave the masjid. She said, he went, he said to his mother, I want to perform Umrah. He went, he performed Umrah, he came back home. She said, he got home, he had a bath, he came. Gave his mother a kiss and his mother says, you know, I looked at him and I said, my son, I am so happy with you. He went to sleep and never woke up. I have one question. If they gave up on this youngster, what would have happened? If they did what everybody else did and gave up on him, would this youngster be like that? Do you know what it takes for a mother to say to these ulama? I swear in the name of Allah, I am happy with my son up to the day of Qiyamah. I could never ever have a better son than that. That is who we should be. Let's be amongst the best. Let's be amongst those who will make others feel like they can do their best. I'll finish up with one incident. We were in India and at the Marcus in Izamuddin, Mohan Ibrahim Devla was giving a talk and he mentioned a very beautiful incident. He said there was a man who in the streets of Nizamuddin used to sell alcohol at night. So this man used to the entire night spend selling alcohol. And then closer to Fajr, now everybody's going home, so he would take the alcohol, put it into a cooler bag, close it up, and then he came into the markets to wash his face. Because he wanted to freshen up before going home. 
So he came in and the brother next to him, as he sat down to wash his face, the brother next to him recognized him. And he knew this is the guy that sells alcohol on the streets. So he started talking to him and his brother washed his face and then he was ready to go. So the brother said to him, you washed your face, <laughs> what's the big deal? Make your wudu. So he looked at him and said, I'm not here to make wudu. He said, take care, you don't talk to me. He said, come on, you just wash your face. I'm washing my hand, wash your hand. So he washed his hand, he thought to himself, this man's not going to let go of me, let me just make the wudu. As they finished the wudu, this brother carried on talking. And he spoke intentionally until the time Salah began. And then he held his hand and he said, Come on, you just made wudu. Just come read the school of and you can go. So he joined him. This brother says, When I got to the university, I thought, Two rakats and that's it, I'm done. After the Salah was over, this brother carried on talking and you know, telling him a few things, and then the bayan started. And as the talk started, this man listened, and at the end of that talk, this man stood up and he said, that's it. If Allah is so kind, why am I selling alcohol in the streets? He left from there, he went out in the path of Allah, he came back, he went, he performed the Hajj, he came back. And why Mala narrated this incident at that time? He said a few days before, they were all having tea after Asr, and he said a youngster walked into the workplace on the back, and Mala asked those around him, and tell me, who is this youngster that walked in? He looks like the essence of Sunnah. If you look at this youngster, he looks like Sunnah. So they said, we don't know who he is. So they called him. When he came in front, Bana asked him, who are you? He says, I'm the same one that came in here to wash my face. Now, if people gave up on him, where would he have been? He could have never become the best. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who will strive to be the best in everything we do, and may Allah make us amongst those who will encourage others to also be the best.